One of the best things of living in Holyhead is the people. They are so friendly. It's handy for the ferry. It goes to Dublin. It's lovely. It takes you across the island all the way out. Um, the tourists, they're always funny to watch. If Hollyhead was an animal. It'd be a tortoise. It's been around for a while and you never know how long it'll last, but it looks ancient. Mark Steele's in town. Thanks very, very much indeed. Uh, welcome to Mark Steele's in town, which this week comes from the Ukeldry Centre uh, in Hollyhead. Uh, speaking as an outsider, when you uh, arrive here in Hollyhead, right at the very far end of Wales, you get here to these sort of glorious cliffs and tranquil coves and you can't help feeling, bloody hell, you're miles from anywhere, aren't you? <laughs> This is not somewhere you come to live if you want to be just in a bit of Wales. You come here if you never want to see England again. <laughs> this is... <laughs> the first people to come here must have come up from another bit of Wales going, Come on, we've got to go further into Wales, come on! <laughs> Keep going, never mind Clan Dud. No, that's practically Liverpool. Come on, up we come! <laughs> And then eventually some people, Oh, we've come so far that we're in a whole new island, Anglesey. Hmm. Not far enough. Come on, keep going. <laughs> now, what's this place? Clan Vile, Pulchwing, Wek, Bilgeri, Clan Job, Wek, Clan Tisilio, Go, Go, Go. <laughs> well, that's a little bit Welsh, but not enough. Keep going. <laughs> we can get for the right. There's another island here, off the island, that's off Wales. Holy Island. Not far enough. Come on. <laughs> And then right at the very, very end, here's Hollyhead. What must be annoying is it still didn't work, because you've come all this way and the English still pop up here every couple of days and buy another street. And, uh, <laughs> which is probably why you've come here tonight. You're worried if you turn your back, I'll buy the centre as a weekend cottage. <laughs> I, uh, I do also really love the town motto, and people use it a lot, which is, all the nearest ones in Clandudno. <laughs> 80 mile round trip. <laughs> I've heard people say it about a bookshop, a bowling alley, about the nearest place to get wood cut. <laughs> and now, of course, Prince William and Kate have moved up here at, at some point. I love the idea that they must have been told, nearest ones in Clandudno. <laughs> you won't get a dubstep club nearer than that, Your Highness. <laughs> A uh, clue to how far away you are here is when you get here, if you go to certain bits of the town, your mobile beeps because it thinks you're in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> and then you ring someone while you're on the Irish network and it's cost you about 50 quid. <laughs> So this is a brilliant quirk of history that this is the only bit of Britain that's been invaded by the Irish. <laughs> it wouldn't be that surprised the Irish if you set up the Hollyhead Republican Army that went around wearing balaclavas and chucking rocks at the mobile phone companies shouting, Take that, you orange bastards! <laughs> It would only be fair to say, you do obviously get lots of tourists um, come up here, that is true. To be fair, most of them carry at least one stick uh, <laughs> and a pair of binoculars. In fact, this uh, tourist pamphlet I've got here says, When visiting Holyhead, take your binoculars to observe passing shipping. <laughs> You're not quite trying to challenge Ibiza, are you? <laughs> There can't be many teenagers that come up here. Oh, like, we had this, like, weekend in Hollyhead and it was, like, awesome because we, like, saw a ship through binoculars and everything. It was, like, banging. <laughs> I wonder how many people have gone back from holiday and said the sentence, Oh, we definitely recommend a weekend in Hollyhead. We stood on a hill and saw a tug on the way to Liverpool. <laughs> uh, now, one of, the, one of the attractions here, honestly, being this, is it, uh, it is an extraordinarily friendly place. Everyone seems to want to talk to you, even if sometimes you're not quite sure what they mean. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> we got to the hotel, I had a hat on, the bloke at the hotel, he said, oh, a hat. <laughs> and then, I, honestly, this is exact words, he said, you're from London, aren't you? <laughs> then he said... They have a lot of hats in London. <laughs> I 
Also, Holyhead is a town of about uh, 11,000, I believe that's right, but uh, I wonder that there is still that many here because one of the most popular pastimes in the town is seeing how fast you can drive around the bit of road known as the Cliff Bends. Uh, <laughs> For example, there's an internet forum about the bends on a local website. This is what one person wrote. It was fantastic. I went sideways round the bend by the cliff in my old cavalier in the wet. I thought I was going to die. And then Baz replied with, I have a beach named after me on the cliff bends. My car landed on it. Uh, you do obviously have a grand history, Hollyhead, being an important port. Many prominent people have been through here. Uh, in the early days, passengers might have to wait for the right sailing conditions and enjoy the delights of the town. For example, Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, was stuck here for a week and wrote a delightful poem about the town. Oh, Neptune, Neptune, must I still be here detained against my will? <laughs> Well, here I sit in Hollyhead with muddy ale and mouldy bread. Convict of lies is every sign. The inn has not a drop of wine. All Christian vital stink of fish. I'm where my enemies would wish. <laughs> Sweet, isn't it? <laughs> now, the reason that he was here and the reason that there is a place here is mostly because in 1572, Queen Elizabeth I decided she needed a regular postal service from London to Ireland, and the safest and most convenient route was from here to Dublin. So post boys came on horseback with packets from London. Uh, it took 41 hours in winter and then three days at sea to get to Ireland. Now, the thing is, when you know that your message has to go through all that, at least you are going to make an effort to write something worthwhile, aren't you? I don't suppose people got a quill pen and wrote a letter and sealed it and sent it off in a packet and then four days later in Dublin, someone opened it up and said, ah, what does it say? Let's see. OMG awesome. <laughs> we must reply instantly. L-O-L. -L. <laughs> now get the servants to deliver this packet to the Port Godspeed with fair winds. It shall reach London in four days. <laughs> Now, it must seem odd living here as well, because thousands of people come through, but very, very few of them stop. Uh, to the outsider, this is sort of, it's romantic, Hollyhead, because it's sort of probably taken ages to get here, and then you're now heading across the Irish Sea to Ireland, it's, it's exciting, and you're on a ferry, and you're going to be with a load of people who will almost certainly be drunk. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you all know the Pogues song, Boat Train, about a trip here that goes, first we drank some whiskey, then we drank some gin, then we drank tequila, I think that's what did me in. <laughs> I woke up in the toilet when we got to Hollyhead, the doors were all a-banging and I wished that I was dead. Now that's, you should be proud of that. It made Shane McGowan think he'd gone too far. That's a time <laughs> worth having. I do want to ask, do people here, do you ever go on the ferry? What's, has anyone been on the crossing when it's got really rough and started chucking about? I'm the captain on it. You're the captain on it? No, it's lots of fun. You know, I always enjoy watching people getting sick. We've got very good CCTV systems. We have com com competitions on the bridge where we can look around and sort of family groups, you'll see the kids going first, and then the mum and dad <laughs> trying to look away. And as soon as the kids go in the bag, mum goes, then dad's next. It's a, it's a very common thing. I mean, there, there are times when it's been so bad, it's like the Crimea, the sort of uh, <laughs> bodies around the cabin, people sitting around campfires playing mouth organs, <laughs> you know, bandages around the head, horses been shot. <laughs> it, it can get quite bad. The captain on the ferry. Uh... One time, when I was coming from Dunleary to Holyhead, it was really rough. And uh, I went out on the, on the deck. There was waves going everywhere. Just And there was me and one other bloke out there sort of looking at each other. And he's sort of going up and down. And this bloke walked over. And he was German. And he honestly walked over to me and he said, Ah, the sea. It is a merciless beast. <laughs> The 
is, I think you're travelling across the sea, it's a proper way to travel because you can see the obstacles, you can see what you're crossing and, you know, it's not like on a plane. I remember sort of being on this plane once and the captain announced, he said, because of, you know, the wind directions or something, he said, we will be arriving in Gatwick um, about 20 minutes later than scheduled. And this woman who was sat next to me went, oh! I and mean, I thought, oh, for God's sake, woman, you're travelling across a whole ocean for most of humanity. It would not have been possible to imagine making this journey. Or if you did, it would have taken you six weeks and you'd have caught scurvy and probably tipped up and been eaten by sharks. And now you're just worried because, oh, bloody hell, now I'm going to miss cash in the attic. <laughs> but... The ferry, you couldn't possibly be on a ferry, even the most impatient person, if it's a false eight gale, going up to the captain going, oh, for God's sake, do something about those waves. I'm supposed to be at a meeting in Dunleary at nine o'clock. <laughs> I spent a, an afternoon, actually, wandering around the port, and what amazed me there is how calm it is, given that this huge, great enormous machine sort of comes in and out several times a day. And I, I went in the control room, and there's a, a couple of blokes there who have to monitor the ferries. And they're just calm, going, oh, right, there it is. <laughs> Bust through to the captain. Yeah, you've got about 300 yards to go. <laughs> and you'll be on the land, see? <laughs> <laughs> If this was me, I'd be going, watch out, for Christ's sake, slow down. If you go too far, you'll go up the high street and land in the co-op. What are you doing? <laughs> You've come far enough. The passengers won't mind. They've got most of the way. Make them swim the last few yards. Don't, what are you doing? But nothing flaps them. I can imagine them going, bzzz. I'll always have the coast guard. <laughs> Thought I'd better report there's a sea monster by the brig <laughs> He's got three heads and a trident. <laughs> Should we get a brew on? <laughs> uh, the sea, historically, obviously, you know, it can be a merciless beast. When I was shown round the museum by John, there's a lovely man who runs the museum there, and the first thing he showed me was some bits from a ship, the Primrose Hill. And he said, oh, I'd sank off the Olliard coast in 1900, and uh, the ship was lost. And then he showed me some cuttings about a ship called the Anglia, that hit a main in the First World War, and the ship was lost. <laughs> and then he showed me some pieces salvaged from the Thetis submarine in 1939 that sank during a trial, and the ship was lost. <laughs> I said, do you ever tell a story <laughs> that doesn't end up with and the ship was lost? I could imagine him reading his version of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. <laughs> Baby bear said, who's been sleeping in my bed? And at that point, a freak wind blew the house into the sea and the ship was lost. <laughs> to be fair, the museum does also have uh, a mammoth that lived here back before Neolithic times. The mammoth has been called Mifanwi, I'm sure you'll know about it. And the bones are by this marvellous description at the museum that says, and I quote, Mifanwi roamed Hollyhead about 10,000 years ago. Hollyhead looked much different then. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Don't you? <laughs> Who'd have thought that 10,000 years ago Hollyhead was not only different but much different? <laughs> Maybe they could do pictures of then and now and have a spot the difference competition. <laughs> well, there's no post office. There's a mammoth. There's not so many of them now. And it looks like there was more to do back then. <laughs> The, uh, the most celebrated seafarer from the town was Commander John Skinner, as in the Skinner Memorial, which is a big obelisk that's on the hill that looks over the town. And uh, the first interesting thing about Skinner, being the sort of representative of the town, if you like, from history, uh, is that he wasn't from Hollyhead. He was from New Jersey in America. Which, I mean, sort of suggests you're a bit short on celebrities here. Uh, <laughs> if you want another monument, perhaps you'll go, oh, no one around here deserves it. Let's build one to Rihanna. <laughs> Skinner fought for the British in the War of Independence, commanding a ship called the Phoenix, but the Phoenix was fired on and he lost an arm and the ship caught fire and sunk. Uh, it was decided he couldn't carry on in the Navy, because, I mean, yeah, what can you do in the Navy if you've only got one arm? <laughs> 
He seems to have become quite popular in the town, partly because he gave away money to, to various causes, but also he was considered a, a local character because he went hunting with one arm and, frustratingly, according to my account of him, he was usually accompanied by his tame, mischievous raven. And that's all it says about it. <laughs> Frustrating is why do books do that? There'll be 50 pages about the route to some battle or something, and then they'll slip something by, like, on his return to France, he became a ladyboy before rejoining the Pope. <laughs> what? That's the interesting bit. Tell me about the raven. You make a, a brilliant case for tourism here. For example, in Ismon, Anglesey, this brochure says, best of all, we're an island, so the chances are that on any given day, conditions will be perfect for you somewhere. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not big on meteorology and all that. Does that work? Because it's an island, every day there's a selection of perfect holiday <laughs> conditions. <laughs> Today, it's perfect for sunbathing in Holyhead, but in Kamais Bay, it's ideal for skiing. <laughs> uh, there are other reasons for having your holiday here. This is from the same brochure. I quote, Walking on Anglesey brings out the romantic in everyone. It certainly worked with teacher Dave from Altrincham. He plucked up the courage to go on a speed dating stroll as part of the Anglesey Walking Festival. <laughs> on a walking festival? How does that work? Hello, I'm Dave, I like your boots. What sort of music do you like? Mind the puddle, I'm a teacher. Have you been to the lighthouse? It's shut for wind, I'm afraid. Don't go near the edge. Oh, you're a Satanist, I'll let you know. Would you like some mint cake? Bye. <laughs> According to the brochure, honestly, it's in here, maybe it was the sunset over Roscollin or the spirit of St. Dwin Wen, but when Dave set eyes on Lynn, something clicked and they're still together. Now, that is very romantic and heartwarming, and, of course, I wish Lynn and Dave, the teacher from Altrincham, all the best. Although, to be fair, if you meet someone else whose idea of a holiday is a speed-dating stroll across Anglesey, <laughs> you are bound to get together because there will be only two of you. And the high street is very much a community high street, I think, full of people chatting and kids running about, and it's not blighted in any way with open shops, which I think it's... <laughs> which, which I think always gets in the way of a decent high street. <laughs> That's why there were no riots here. What would they have taken? <laughs> Loot has gone, oh, it was brilliant. We smashed the windows of all the shops and we made off with a We Are Closed sign. <laughs> And a big pile of unopened letters from the bailiffs. <laughs> but there was uh, one shop which I was uh, surprised to see, I have to say, Silky Souls, <laughs> a fish pedicure emporium. Because you've got the priorities sorted out here, Hollyhead. <laughs> Obviously, for luxuries like potatoes and toilet rolls, you need to go to Clandudno, but... <laughs> You've got essentials like getting your toes nibbled by a haddock, and that's... <laughs> and we do have with us here uh, Barbie, and so you are the proprietor of the Silky Souls. Not the proprietor, but I do run it, yeah. I know, is, is it a business booming? It the... is. Well, the thing is, after a hard day in the coal mine, you do need to have, <laughs> you know... And the tourists come yeah, in there? Yeah, it's surprising, actually, yeah. And a lot of people, they didn't actually know about it. People from Norway have gone, oh, I didn't know this sort of thing existed. And I was like, yes. So you're teaching Norway about what I'm to do with you, fish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll all be going up there. We've been wasting our time pickling herrings. Exactly. <laughs> all right, brilliant. Thanks very much <laughs> Thank to Barbie and Silky Soul. Um, also, in the spirit of contributing to the community, I did try to get into Hollyhead's favourite night spot. Um, <laughs> now, if any tourists do feel that after a hard day's ship observing and speed dating strolling, they, they want to party hard through the night, then the obvious place to go to is the Piranha. And, um, <laughs> Uh, to get an idea of how loved this establishment is in Hollyhead, I've not met a single person who calls it the Piranha. Everybody calls it the Pit. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, 
this is this might be unfair actually because the pit obviously shows that it cares about education at one point it advertised i quote bring in your a level results and get a free drink <laughs> Because they want you to get on. The, uh... <laughs> but none of that would be as impressive as the fact that, to keep with the piranha theme, they brought in a tank of piranhas. At one point, the RSPCA were investigating whether having a tank of piranhas in a nightclub uh, is cruel to the piranhas. And I think the club should actually tell them that it's an offshoot of Silky Souls. <laughs> and get Barbie to market it as extreme fish pedicure. <laughs> uh, even piranhas in a nightclub isn't as weird as this story. I've got a book called The Marion Conspiracy by a man called Graham Phillips that claims the Virgin Mary came to live in Anglesey. <laughs> The evidence that he gives is the Anglesey Druids were the first to convert to Christianity, so the obvious conclusion is that she popped over here to find someone to be with on a speed dating stroll. <laughs> Hi, I'm from Israel. How about you? My parents were poor too. I did have a son. My husband wasn't the father. Oh no, it's not that. It's complicated. <laughs> Lovely sunset. Would you like a biscuit? I'll let you know. Uh, this area is also popular with people who are fans of the Druids because the Druids ruled Anglesey until 61 AD because even when the Romans invaded Britain they left Anglesey alone for about 20 years until eventually attacking them so the Druids sort of held out more than anyone else and now I mean now sort of Druidism seen as this sort of new age hippie thing you know but according to Hollyhead the story of a port the Romans faced, I quote, terrifying druids, women with flaming torches and armed warriors with hands raised to the heavens, calling down curses upon the invaders. And according to the Roman writer Tacitus, the invading army declared, we should never have attacked when it's closing time at the pit. <laughs> now, someone more modern who should be mentioned, uh, I believe, in any account of the town, is your mayor, who I met last night in the 79 bar, <laughs> Jeff Evans. Now, the job of mayor is usually to open school fates and sort of make speeches where everybody thinks, oh, please, please stop. But <laughs> Jeff's role has been slightly more notable. Do you want to tell everyone about when you went to Parliament? Well, yeah, I, I'm like you. You're a protester, and I'm a great believer that sometimes you have to protest in, a, in order to achieve the aim. And I did. I went up to uh, Big Ben and decided I was going to chain myself to Big Ben and uh, create a protest to get more police in this area. In order to create the maximum problems, I tied the chains around my neck, around my body, around the man's bits <laughs> now when they tried to then to take the chains off me I had to explain very forcefully that bits of it was attached to me but but one of them I think wanted to give me pain and he pulled the chains and I started to talk like a woman uh, I, I, I was arrested, I was set free, I met with the Home Secretary at the time, and as a result of that they put in an extra 20 police officers in this area to deal with issues we had. Also, Jeff, so, uh, just, I mean, people like to sort of try and do crazy things for charity, but I, I think, well, you've won all the prizes, I think. <laughs> the craziest one I did for comic relief was I had permission of Stenner to go on the boat to Ireland. I then took all my clothes off, and I was left with a particularly skimpy thong. <laughs> now, I'm not the, the most healthy-looking guy or the best body, but I had a pair of tweezers, and the people were invited to withdraw airs off my body oh. with, with the tweezers. I, I actually got £2,000, <laughs> but the women travellers took particular pleasure in paying double, and it was a pound a time, for withdrawing the airs from my bottom. <laughs> well, a round of applause for a brilliant company. Just... And also, I think we should send a message to Boris Johnson that that is a proper eccentric mayor. <laughs> 
Don't think you're eccentric because you ride round on a bike and ruffle up your hair and go, oh, good pound of crisis. <laughs> Have your arse hairs pulled out for a pound ago, go, Boris. <laughs> so, uh, the Druids, we've had Druids here, Romans. Uh, Holyhead has been turned into a port by Elizabeth I. Now royalty has moved here again. Prince William, Kate Middleton have a cottage just outside uh, Holyhead. And it turns out they rent it for £750 a month. And I've got to say, what's the matter with you? You could have stung them for ten times, that. <laughs> They're loaded. <laughs> and everyone I've met, everyone says the royal couple is often seen in Tesco. And if you go, <laughs> if you go, really, people say to you, well, they only live round the corner. I mean, I live in London. I've never nipped into Halfords and seen the Queen. <laughs> Just get in the WD-40. <laughs> there is due reverence given uh, all across Holyhead to the Royal Presence. On the internet, for example, on the Holyhead Forum, when it was announced that they were moving here, one of the first responses was, I wonder how he'll enjoy a moonlight kebab. <laughs> Another one was, maybe he'll give his old clothes to charity shops and then we'll see the town's tramps dressed in Savile Row tweeds. <laughs> and I think a sense of the deep, deep respect for royalty from the town was summed up in this message. I, for one, look forward to enjoying a pint or two with Prince William in the Cambria. <laughs> Doubtless he'll be delighted with the tales we can regale him with and learn lots of new words and phrases. <laughs> although most of them he would be wise not to repeat to his nan. <laughs> and whilst he's busy hearing our tales of mirth, I'll take it upon myself to take his girlfriend Kate on a whirlwind tour of the town's pubs, get her drunk and cop a feel in the pit for the last dance. <laughs> I think just to conclude then, Holly Ed, I, I, I honestly mean it, so this is a brilliant place. For example, there's a house in Treyarda Bay that was used as the main house for the film of Wuthering Heights, which is fitting, as Emily Bronte did at first apparently want to set the novel in Hollyhead. And so <laughs> I, will, I will leave you good people of Hollyhead with one piece she wrote in her earliest draft that I, I think does capture the essence of the town. <laughs> Heathcliff spotted Catherine and the pair ran towards each other at enormous speed, almost skidding off the bends and over the cliffs. <laughs> into the merciless beast of the sea. <laughs> that was awesome, said Heathcliff as they embraced. At that point, a bell rang. Time's up, said Catherine. I'll let you know. And she moved along to Dave, a teacher from Altringham. <laughs> Thanks very much. For Mark Steele's In Town was written and performed by Mark Steele with additional material by Pete Sinclair. The producer was Sam Bryant.